so happy that we're all here together on this great Friday afternoon. Um, it is my pleasure to be hosting this joint colloquium for the psych department and for the linguistics department by my dear colleague and friend, Marie Coppola, assistant professor at the University of Connecticut. Um, she has just given one presentation and now she will be giving another. Just a brief um, introduction about some of Marie's uh, kind of academic history. So she and I met back in the 90s, in 94. So we've known each other quite a number of years already. She has um, been one of the most uh, prolific researchers in Nicaragua doing work on the, Nicarag the emerging sign language in Nicaragua and the entire sort of linguistic situation there, starting with home signers and following the subsequent cohorts or generations of Nicaraguan sign. She has recently also been awarded a prestigious NSF career award grant for the next five years to be working with um, deaf children and on math and numeration skills and the relationship between language and numeration. And that work grew out um, directly from her contact uh, with the home signers and the emerging language uh, of Nicaraguan sign language. So it's basic science becoming sort of useful in a practical way. And so it's kind of the best of both worlds. So this afternoon she's going to uh, talk about unexpected roots to language, evidence from child and adult home sign systems. And um, I now give the floor over to Marie. Thank you so much, Diane, for that really warm and lovely introduction. Uh, I really appreciate the invitations to both events. Uh, thank you all for coming uh, on a, late on a Friday afternoon. I would like to share some of the research that I've done in Nicaragua with all of you. And I really would like this, uh, the discussion to be a dialogue and a way for people with different perspectives on how language works and the language faculty to bring together our complementary areas of expertise and really try and get at these fundamental issues of what language is about, how it's represented, um, what is the nature of the language faculty. As Diane mentioned, I'm going to be talking uh, quite a bit about my research with home signers. Uh, those of you who were at the panel earlier uh, already know what I'm talking about when I talk about a home signer. Uh, some deaf people um, may have recollections of their own experience using home signs with their hearing family members. Um, and when people are thinking about that, they're thinking about sort of different vocabulary signs that are different from the conventional ASL signs that uh, they later learned when they became part of the deaf community and acquired ASL. When I'm talking about home sign, I am talking about a whole gesture system that basically functions like uh, sign language for the deaf people I'll be talking about today. So home signers are deaf people. They haven't acquired a conventional language uh, either a spoken one, a written one, or a sign language, and they create gesture systems. And they continue to use these gesture systems throughout their lives as their primary language. That is what they have. They're socially integrated into their communities, so I want to make sure that everyone understands that these are not cases of people like Jeannie, the uh, girl who was found uh, in her home in California after many, many years of neglect. She also um, did not acquire language, but it, she was not exposed to language. She was not also not exposed to typical social interactions and <coughs> affection and love and, and family relationships. Okay, so the people I'm talking about today have all of those things. The thing that they're missing is specifically linguistic input. 
Okay, they get input, right? They see things in the world. They're interacting with people all the time, every day. But those interactions don't contain ling linguistic information from the outside. Okay, I'm going to talk a lot about the linguistic information that home signers innovate and produce. And in fact, here are a few examples of some of that structure. Uh, so some, we have evidence for the grammatical relation of subject, plural morphology, and of course, uh, the work done here at University of Chicago by Susan Goldenmeadow, Carolyn Mylander, and um, their, my colleague, all of us, <laughs> our colleagues, um, with child home science systems has really formed the basis for uh, this continuation of how, what other kinds of devices and complexity might develop when a, syst a home science system continues to be used through adulthood. I want to now show you an example of what a mature home science system looks like. I'm sure almost everybody in this room has seen examples of child home sign. Um, uh, and adult home sign is, um, is different. Uh, and I myself was surprised when I began looking for adult home signers in Nicaragua. Um, and uh, I will let you just see for yourself. I'm going to show this video once, um, just as it is, and then I'll show it to you again with some help, okay, with some, some captions and then s and slower, so you can pick up on some of the things you might have missed the first time. Is it possible to, I'm, I don't know how visible that is, it looks like there's a lot of, yes, great. Uh, so this is me, this is the home signer I'm talking about, this is the same home signer I mentioned in my panel presentation who found out about the deaf community, was kind of like, eh, decided to just keep on with his home sign. He was happy with it. This is his mother. So one clue I didn't tell you is that this video was made in the spring of 2002, which is relevant for the topic. Those of you who know what this is about, please hold, <laughs> restrain yourselves, okay? I'm going to play it again now. Does anyone feel like they, I don't want you to answer, I just want to get a sense. Does anybody think they know anything about what he just said? Okay. Anybody who is not a signer who knows anything about what he just said? All right. My point is made. <laughs> okay, this is not this is not mine. Okay, it's not getting up and acting things out. So he's talking about some pretty complicated things, right? This was not something that he was present for, right? He learned about this event through life, and um, he is now talking about it. I want to mention here his mother, who he lives with, right? He's, he's in his late 20s here. Um, her comment after this conversation, which went on for quite some time, I'm just showing you a very small snip of it, snippet of it, said, the Nicaraguan Civil War was really awful. Indeed it was, but it is not close to the topic that he is talking about here. So that I'm going to return to that point, this sort of lack of successful communication using the home sign system um, as part of the theoretical implications of the work that I want to tell you about. Okay, here is a brief schematic that shows you the role of home sign systems in the emergence of Nicaraguan Sign Language. When a critical mass of deaf children came together in the late 1970s uh, at a center for special education, that was the first time that uh, the we see the beginnings of a deaf community and a sign language 
in Nicaragua. Prior to that time, there was no sign language in the country. Okay, there were very small uh, groups of children, deaf children who came together. They were not allowed to sign. The conditions were not suitable for a sign language to emerge until the late 70s in this center. As, those, as new children entered the school and saw this rudimentary sign communication from that first group, they, passed, they, they, they took that in and they produced a language that was more complex and, um, yeah, more complex. And that process has repeated itself. Uh, it's continuing to repeat itself up until now. So when the, these small houses represent home sign systems of the first children and adolescents who entered that community, and the home sign systems were the basis, okay, the roots of the emergence of that new language. The home sign systems I'm going to be talking about today are represented by these houses. Okay, these houses don't have little arrows that go into the community. These are home signers, deaf people, who do, have not had the opportunity to join or have had it and rejected it, as the, the gentleman you just saw. Um, they have not acquired Nicaraguan Sign Language. They're using their own home sign systems that they have developed. Yeah, so these groups are very distinct. So I want to raise a puzzle. Um, what does it mean to have a language? How should we think about a system that has some, but maybe not all, of the properties that we associate with natural language? And where do these structures come from? And I think that the study of home sign really uh, uniquely offers perspectives on these questions that can't be answered in any other way. I'd like to frame this discussion by considering the relationship between meaning or, and structure, um, or I know these don't exactly overlap, but by considering the relationship between semantics and syntax. It's a, obviously a focus of the department here at University of Chicago, the linguistics department. And um, there have been several proposals about how these are related in acquisition of language. So Tomasello proposes that children acquire words first, and then they acquire structures using those words. Pinker suggested that semantics, or the meaning of words, bootstraps the syntax, helps children learn verbs. And then uh, syntactic bootstrapping uh, basically ha holds the converse, right? That the structure of a sentence helps you learn the meanings of the words. Now, for my purpose, and, and, and so these people have lots of other kinds of disagreements in their, their approach to how kids learn language that we will also address later in today's talk. But for right now, what I want to draw your attention to is that all of these proposals assume that there's linguistic input in the environment. And the phenomena that we'll see, that I'll show you evidence for in home sign, create a bootstrapping problem that doesn't have an obvious solution. Okay, it, so none of these things can be working in home sign because there's nothing to bootstrap from. Um, so not only these proposals, but also other proposals that talk about distributional learning or statistical learning, that's a distribution over an input, right? That is not present for home signers. Um, and Susan Golden Meadow um, has made that point recently. So the specific questions that I will talk about today are whether morphological development precedes syntactic development, and whether it's possible for an emerging language to fail to develop more abstract or arbitrary structure such as phonology, which really hasn't been addressed in the previous literature. 
And when I say emerging language here, I am talking, I mean, I mean to include both uh, home sign and Nicaraguan sign language, although I'll only be talking about the home sign data today. Third, I'll talk about uh, some studies looking at whether a conventional lexicon has to be the starting point for future morphological and grammatical developments. And then finally, I want to return to that point that I alluded to um, when I talked about how the home signer's mother doesn't understand him. Uh, what is the role of communication and social interaction? Um, and it's a complicated role, okay? It's not straightforward. It's not that it matters not at all, and it's not that it is totally crucial for structure to, for, that it contributes structure. Okay, so here's my little bit of um, ASL discourse. Um, I have to tell you what I'm gonna say before I tell you what I'm gonna say. <laughs> so I'm gonna answer those questions very briefly and then I'll uh, describe the evidence more in a more detailed way. So what we'll see is that hand-shaped complexity marks morphological distinctions uh, and I'll be referring to that as morphophonology. And that morphophonological structure emerges before morphosyntax, which may seem a little counterintuitive. With respect to how fast a lexicon conventionalizes, we see that the patterns of social interactions in a network affect how quickly that happens. And we have both behavioral evidence as well as computational modeling evidence for that. But those social interaction patterns don't provide the structure. Okay, they're necessary for it, they, they influence it, but they're not actually providing the structure. And I, I wanna argue and, and, and also discuss the implications of these findings for theories of the role of meaning, reference, and interaction in creating structure in home sign. So first, I'll address this question of how handshape comes to be used linguistically. And this work is um, primarily a collaboration with Diane Brantari, um, Susan Goldenmeadow, and Laura Horton, and Ann Sanghaas also uh, collaborate on this question. So Brantari and colleagues have shown that different handshape types express different classes of events. And those patterns appear in signers, but not in gesturers. So the people who um, are fluent in a sign language will already know about this, but I'll give you uh, some examples uh, for those of you who are not signers. So I wanna contrast Transitive events, those events that have agents, that a person doing something, manipulating something, with events that do not have an agent. What we see in morphosyntax is that handshape type expresses this contrast. So here you see examples of handshapes that are used to manipulate a small object, okay? So that handshape is the handshape that you use when you're talking about picking up a tic-tac or something very small. In contrast, when you're talking about an event where there's no agent manipulating anything, the handshape represents the object itself. And so you see here three different handshapes that take on the properties of the object that they refer to. So I wanna turn now to another level of linguistic structure that's also in evidence here, and this is the morphophonological level. And here we're talking about selected finger group. These, these three handshapes up to the here are examples of handshapes where the selected fingers are very easy to describe. So uh, here it's, these two fingers that are selected, that are involved in forming the sign. Here it's all of the fingers. Here it's all but the thumb. We ignore the thumb. You can talk to Diane about that later. Um, here uh, we have the medium and high complexity handshapes, 
where you need more nodes in the structure to describe to, to represent which fingers are being selected. Okay? So there's a, a, a complexity range here. It's not that all handling hand shapes are low complexity in terms of selected fingers, but there's a strong tendency for that. But only the object hand shapes have medium and high complexity hand shapes. Okay, so this, these distinctions are really important because they serve as the foundation for the next uh, several studies that I'll talk about. Okay, so I just wanted to highlight that um, the thing I already said. So some of you may be asking, why are we calling this morphophonology? Or maybe you're not asking that because you all know Diane. But um, basically what we're, uh, our, our definition here of what counts as morphophonology is a case where you have a set of classifiers that form a morphological class and they also form a phonological class. So here, all of the hand shapes in this set on the left have this fully open joint specification. I haven't talked about joints. I'm not going to say more about joints. But they're all open on the joints. You don't see any bending. Okay, So on that joint feature, they're all the same. So they're a morphological class. And then they also function as a phonological class. On the other hand, you could imagine a morphological class that is not a phonological class, where the joint feature, the joint specification differs across the hand shapes. Okay, so this is the kind of uh, uh, combination of features that we're talking about functioning as a morphophonological class. I want to give you an idea now of what uh, the data look like and the stimuli as well as the data uh, that I'll be talking about in the results coming up. So the first study I'm going to talk about is a longitudinal study of one child home signer. So I was able to study him between the ages of 7 and 12 years of age. This is towards the end of that longitudinal study. And um, the video clip shows the stimulus item that he's talking about and then his response, and then you'll see it again slowed down. So the analysis I'm about to show you, we're only considering the event description in these analyses. So in that response you just saw, that's the first part, the, the action part. And then you notice at the end, he labels the plane. He tells you what kind of object was participating in that event. But the results I'm showing you now are only about this event part. And what we did is we, um, we transcribed all of these hand shapes. and. Um, we select, we, in a very detailed way, and then we took all of that detail and we mushed it into uh, one, two, or three, basically, set of categories that reflect how the complexity level. So these hand shapes uh, reflect the fact that these are, uh, it takes a lot of description, okay, to arrive at how those fingers get selected to produce this hand shape. So what we found in our initial study of uh, a comparison of how home signers and hearing gesturers perform this task, we had them do exactly the same task. We asked the hearing people to not speak and just describe these events using their hands. And we coded them according to the exact same coding scheme. And what we found is that 
the home signers, but not the hearing gesturers, showed that uh, cross-linguistically uh, observed sign language pattern where um, the handling handshapes were used for manipulation events and the object handshapes were used when there was no agent. So what we learned from that result is that that, that pattern that we see cross-linguistically in sign languages is not just about using your hands to talk about events because we see different patterns in home signers and hearing gesturers. It's also not an elaboration uh, of the patterns that we see. It's not fancy gesture, okay? It's qualitatively different in the way it uses these features to relate to the meanings that are being described. And because we see that pattern in home signers, it means that it doesn't require a linguistic community to develop because home signers don't participate in a linguistic community. They have a social communicative community, but not a linguistic community. Okay, so I want to turn now to the patterns that we saw in adult home signers with respect to the morphophonology. So I was talking before about how this handshape gets that three rating, okay, there's a high complexity handshape, and that's what's being plotted here on the y-axis, the complexity of the handshape. And then we have uh, each of four adult home signers, you can see they were all in their 20s when we tested them on this task. And you'll see the complexity ratings for the object handshapes in light gray and the handling handshapes in the black. And what you see is in three of the four adult home signers, the selected finger complexity is higher for those object handshapes than it is for the handling handshapes. There's variability in how high it is, but what's important is that distinction, that contrast between the complexity levels across those two types of handshape that mark morphosyntax. So where does that child home signer fit in with respect to this pattern? Well, at the age of 12, he was already showing that adult home sign pattern. So not only does it not, this, this um, morphophonological development not require a linguistic community, it also doesn't require a whole lifetime of using a home sign system. He was able to do it at 12. Okay, so does that morphophonological pattern appear before or after the morphosyntactic, the morphosyntactic pattern that we talked about? The association of a handling handshape with an agentive event and an object handshape without an agent. So as I mentioned, we tested him from the ages of seven and a half to 12 and a half. And again, you see the selected finger complexity on the y-axis here. And what we see is that, that that morphophonological pattern appeared at the age of 11. Okay, it wasn't present before that. Um, I, it appeared sometime before he was 11 and after he was 10. And this, this is a little bit later than this development, the corresponding development in deaf children who are acquiring ASL as a native language. Okay, so they acquire this pattern by or between the ages of four and six. So he's doing it on his own, taking him a little bit longer. Fair. Okay, um, I wanna just briefly comment on the morphosyntactic pattern that we see in established sign languages. Uh, I already described this uh, in words. This is just what um, individual ASL adults would look like. They would be using handling handshapes for agentive events and object handshapes with non-agentive events, just to show you what the typical sign established sign language pattern is. Now I wanna show you what the child home signer looks like.
So for agentive events, he is looking pretty much like adult ASL signers. But interestingly, for the events without an agent, he doesn't really have a preference for one kind of handshape over the other. And this is a little bit, I found it counterintuitive um, when, when we saw these data. This makes sense. You see an agent, you do a uh, uh, handling handshape. He's all over the place with the object handshapes. He's producing the, the two handshape types equally often. But importantly, he's making a distinction between the two kinds of events, even though he hasn't fully gotten to the established sign language pattern. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip this point, we can return to it. This is the seeds of a noun-verb distinction. Um, we can return to this in, di in the discussion, but I wanna move on to the next kind of, to the next question. And I'm gonna skip the summary. Okay. So now I want to turn to another domain where you might think that being able to observe meaningful events in the world might, uh, and this having interactions with, with other people in your family, uh, talking about the same things all the time, might actually help a home signer um, pick, or might help that group decide, conventionalize on a particular form to represent a particular meaning. So I want to turn now to some studies we've done on the conventionalization of the lexicon. What we ask people to do is produce gestures in response to very simple images of everyday objects. And what we measured is the distance between the responses of any two participants. I can explain the details of how we did that um, in the question period if you like. But we looked at this both in a home sign type network where the deaf person is this, the center node and then they're using that home sign system with each of their communication partners who are hearing. But those communication partners don't use the home sign with each other. Okay, they're using, they're gesturing with the home signer. These hearing people are really great gesturers but they don't use it with each other. They're speaking Spanish to each other because it's easier for them. It's their native language. So that's the star type network that we see in home sign. I want to contrast that with a, a sign language type network. Uh, in this case, we tested Nicaraguan signers. And what you see here is that all of the signers have the possibility of communicating with and interacting with all of the other signers. So this is a fully interactive network. And what we did is we wanted to compare the Nicaraguan signers and the home signers to see how conventionalized their lexical items were after the same amount of time of being used. So we picked 25 years because uh, that was basically how old the home signers were at that point. Um, if you assume that the home signers, we picked two, okay? We just picked two, that that was when they started using their home sign. Um, we tested them 25 years later, and so we found a comparable group of Nicaraguan signers who had been interacting for 25 years, and we tested them after the same period of time. So here is what we found. You'll see the results for the Nicaraguan signers here and the home signers here. Same amount, same period of time of experience, almost the same mean age. And what I'm showing you here on the y-axis is a measure of how conventionalized their lexical items were, their words to refer to the same thing. So a score of zero here means they all produced the same sign when they saw a picture of a cow. Okay, they all produced the same sign when they saw a picture of an orange. Okay, so zeros here mean they're all on the same page, they're all using the same sign. 
That's what we see across all of the pairs of Nicaraguan signers. In contrast, what we see in the home sign systems is that none of those pairs of home signers, uh, a home signer and their communication partner, were producing exactly the same sign for those very common objects after 25 years of interacting on a daily basis. This was very surprising to me. Uh, I'm not showing you here, but they're getting closer, okay? So the slopes of these go down over time, but they are not fully conventionalized. They're certainly nowhere near as conventionalized as the Nicaraguan signers are. So we decided to test whether that network structure is the thing that might be driving this difference in the rate of conventionalization. So we, and I mean the royal we here, I did not do the computational modeling work, but um, the simulate, my, co my collaborators, uh, Russell Ritchie, my graduate student, and Charles Young, um, devised a computational model that uh, had all of these properties uh, it was an agent-based model with a very simple learning algorithm. I can talk about some of the details again in the discussion period. But what we found is some very striking differences between these two networks. So the average number of interactions to convergence, which you can think of as conventionalization when they agree on what the sign should be for a particular meaning, uh, was, mu was significantly lower for the Nicaraguan signer. The, the, these are not real people, right? These are agents. Um, but for the NSL type network is much lower than for the home sign type network that's not fully connected. And in fact, all of the sign language type networks converged eventually, whereas only 80% converged in the star type network. So to sum up, what we learned from that study is that conventionalization of lexical items happens more rapidly given typical richly connected linguistic community structure. So I want to briefly describe some findings from a study we did on narrative development. And again, you might think that having access to observing meaningful events in the world and then retelling them might help home signers uh, develop more structure. Um, but it turns out that it doesn't uh, compared to their uh, peers who are participating, they're not their peers, sorry, compared to signers who are part of a deaf community. So back to our good old friends uh, Tweety and Sylvester from the Canary Row cartoon. We asked people to watch that cartoon and retell the story. And then we analyzed their productions and we got a measure of story goodness. So this measure says uh, how well organized your story is and how complete it is based on its episodic structure. So a complete episode here has to have all three of these components, an initiating event, an attempt, and a direct consequence. So for those of you who saw the examples that I showed earlier in the panel discussion, what we want to know is where the, where the differences, I think most of you were able to see the sort of global differences in the amount of information and the quality of information that was produced in the home sign narrative versus the Nicaraguan sign language narrative. And now I want to quantify that in terms of how many complete episodes people in each of these groups produced. So here you'll see the home signers. So we're sort of increasing in terms of language evolution on the x-axis. We have each individual home signer, four members of cohort one. They were the input to cohort two, et cetera. And then we have ASL just as a, a sort of baseline measure of what an established deaf community sign language uh, looks like on this measure. 
So what I'd like you to notice is that the number of complete episodes increases with um, between home signers and cohort one in terms of participating in a linguistic community. And then as language evolution proceeds, we see increase, uh, corresponding increases in the quality of the story, how much information is being conveyed, as well as how it's, it's being organized. So the takeaways from that study are that social interaction doesn't, and being able to see stuff happen in the world doesn't compensate for a lack of linguistic input or not participating in a linguistic community. And that those experiences mediate both, well, I didn't show you direct evidence for this, but we can discuss this, um, both the encoding and the expression of observable events in the world, right? Things that everyone has the ability to perceive all of the people in the study, but what they're doing with that information they perceive is mediated by these factors. So far, what we've seen is uh, two examples of domains where participating in a linguistic community appears to be really important for certain kinds of linguistic structure to develop, uh, conventionalized lexicon and narrative abilities. But maybe we're missing something by looking only at production. Okay? Maybe communicating about these events and these meanings might be more revealing about how structure develops in home sign. So I want to turn now to a systematic examination of that point I raised early. What's the role of communicating and understanding each other in, um, in the context of a home sign family group? And what role does that play in developing the structure we see in home sign? So this is a study that I've done in collaboration with my doctoral student, Emily Kerrigan. And it's focused on how family members comprehend the utterances that home signers produce. So I had noticed, going way back um, many years, that the home signers' family members really struggled to understand many of the things that they said. So what we did is uh, we decided to really pare this down. We had the home signers describe very simple events and then to their communication partners and then the partners had to describe, uh, sorry, had to pick the picture that matched. We compared the scores of the home signers' mothers and the other family members, although I'm gonna focus on the mothers here to the comprehension scores of AL, ASL signers here in the United States, deaf native signers who have never met a Nicaraguan home signer. They have no experience with home sign systems in Nicaragua, just in the context of that, of doing this task. So we had several different event types these are just, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I just want to give you a sense of the kinds of events. These are fairly simple events. It's not that hard to pick out the right answer if you're following what, what the gestures are. So I'll just pick this one to describe. So here you have a reversible event for, with two entities. So the correct event, the video that, that the home signer is describing is a man kisses a woman. And then the pictures that the communication partner has to choose from, or the ASL signer, are the, the reverse, so where the woman is kissing the man, a totally unrelated one, where it's uh, the man's doing something completely different, and another unrelated one where he's acting on an inanimate object. Okay, so this isn't like um, a man kisses a woman wearing a brown sweater versus a man kisses a woman wearing a navy blue sweater. Right? These are not the kinds of contrasts that we're asking people to make. Here are the results for um, comparing the home signers' mothers in how well they understood, they picked the, how, how often they picked the right picture, compared to how often the ASL signers who have never met these people, okay, how well they did on this test. 
So you see in three out of the four cases, the ASL signers perform significantly better, not just statistically, I'm like pretty freaking, you know, significantly <laughs> better, <laughs> okay? Um, this, um, well, whatever, I mean, it is what it is, but uh, this mom is really good, okay? She's a really good comprehender, and everyone in that family is pretty good, so that, that's a lucky home signer. Okay, but I found this result incredibly striking, and quite consistent with my observations of their behavior in real life. I don't want to go through the charts here. I just want to point out that when you consider all of the family members, the factor that related uh, to, the, to their compreh comprehension score was the age that they were tested and how old they were when they first started interacting with the home signer. Those were the things that related to comprehension performance and not how many years of experience they had communicating with the home signers. So that means that on average, younger siblings were much better at this task than mothers who were much older at the time that they started interacting using the home sign system. And it doesn't matter what kind of event, you see the same pattern. I don't wanna spend more time on this. So the takeaway messages from that set of studies is that successful communication does not seem to be driving the development of linguistic structure in home sign systems. Because I think, I, I hope that I've convinced you, there's not a lot of successful communication that's based on the gestures that the home signer produces. There's successful communication happening in lots of other ways, based on routines, based on shared knowledge, based on you know, all kinds of contextual information, but it's not coming from the actual things that the home signer says with their hands. However, it's clear, <laughs> okay, it's clear that having someone to interact with and engage with is necessary for this kind of structure to emerge. It stimulates linguistic structure, but it's not directly creating that linguistic structure. The mothers are not inventing a gesture system and kind of giving it to their deaf son or daughter. Because if that were the case, it seems reasonable to expect that they would understand it when the home signer says it back to them. Okay, so I wanna just sum up the findings that I've described to you from this, these uh, four sets of studies. First, uh, going back to the, the analyses of child and adult home sign, we see that hand shape complexity marks morphophonological distinctions, and that that morphophonological structure emerges earlier in development than morphosyntactic structure. Uh, I skipped this part, but um, in work that uh, Susan and Diane and Laura and Ann Sanghas and I did together, uh, based on that, those, those same stimuli, those same kinds of events and coding, we also found evidence for a very robust distinction between nominals and predicates. We saw that when you look at how the lexicon, the list of words that are used by home signers and Nicaraguan signers, and how, whether they're all agreed on, we see that the social interaction patterns influenced that development, both in real life, in a naturalistic kind of situation, as well as from a computational modeling perspective. We saw from the studies of narratives that home sign structure does not faithfully reproduce event features or the structure of events out in the world. Even though you can see something happening, that doesn't automatically mean that you're encoding it in terms of um, cause and effect relationships or other, um, other conceptual groupings 
based on temporal and causal um, relationships. And then from the set of studies looking at comprehension of the home science systems, I'm arguing that successful communication doesn't drive the development of the linguistic structure that we see in home science. Okay, let's take a minute to look at the bigger picture here. Um, I'm a big fan of home sign research. I've been doing this for 25 years. Um, it's really great for linguistics and for cognitive science and for furthering our knowledge about ourselves as humans. Being a home signer and being deprived of language is not great, okay? It's very limiting. Um, I, I, we talked earlier in the day about uh, how home signers, nevertheless, despite their lack of participation in a linguistic community, they do develop an identity. Um, so I, I, I don't intend for this to be robbing them of their dignity as people, but I think it's pretty clear that they're not able to reach their full capacity in the absence of being exposed to linguistic input. So to address that, I um, have two initiatives. One is uh, founding an organization here in Chicago, at the University of Chicago, in the context of Susan's lab with some students uh, called Manos Unidas, Hands Together, that works to promote educational access, equal access to language and education and vocational opportunities for deaf people in Nicaragua. And at UConn, I strongly encouraged a group of students to form a student organization that also works both to raise money, but also to advocate for access to high quality language input, not just for deaf kids in Nicaragua, but for all kinds of groups that are vulnerable uh, to not getting that good input. Kids from bilingual families, kids from uh, low socioeconomic status families, we all know about the gaps uh, in language input that kids get. Um, so they're advocating and educating people about that to improve language outcomes and of course other outcomes in other cognitive domains for all kids. And of course, um, I have to acknowledge all of the collaborators who make this work possible and um, the funding agencies who support it financially. Thank you. that you gave another talk this this afternoon, not this morning, with the Tweety Bird and Sylvester. And you did, you showed some results about the home signers and Nicaraguan sign language users and that they use less, the home signers use less classifiers to, to describe the scenes. Um, I, I was able to capture some of the expressions on their faces and it seemed that um, the home signers use minimal facial expression where the cohort three used more facial expressions like they became the cat, they became the bird or the old lady. Um, so I noticed the distinction between those two groups. Thanks, Rishi, for your observation. That is, in fact, true. Uh, we did, that analysis that I showed didn't specifically look at the use of classifiers in each of the groups, although we did code that. But I think it's a really, really interesting, and it brings me to a point that I, I usually make when I talk about those results, which is that even the things that seem very 
gestural and mimetic that are part of a sign language, of a, a fluent sign language description of that kind of story, you see more of that the more evolved the language is. Right? So the home signers are actually relying, they're more on the gesture continuum end of that. So you might expect more of that from them. But that has already become taken up and made part of the linguistic structure of the language. And it's, it is not a sort of a basic thing that you get for free, okay, is to represent characters in those ways. Even though it's totally observable, it's right there. It's what people sometimes naturally do when they're um, forced to use only their bodies to communicate. But that coordination that you see in the Nicaraguan signers um, reflects the fact that that is a linguistic development, even though it looks very acty outy and um, kind of more gestury and basic. So the other point that I wanted to make is when we counted up uh, both the number of events that uh, participants expressed in the narrative as well as how they were packaged, we did not care how they did it. They could have literally gotten up and acted it out like charades and we would have given them credit. But the home signers didn't do that. And uh, that's not what they do in their regular life either. Um, they, so it, it's really striking to me that even though they have the basic linguistic nuts and bolts to put together sentences that it would, would express those events, there's something clearly limiting about their underlying conceptual structure that prevents that from being expressed. It's not the, the linguistic means of expression that I think is uh, the limiting factor. I think it's the underlying conceptual, like I said, encoding and um, that affects the, how well they can express um, both the quantity and quality of the events. Would you come up? When, when you study Mike? When you study home signers, is it a possible research question? How many distinct items do they have in their lexicons? And if you can make sense out of that question, how does it relate to the other things that you study? That's a good question. So um, from Susan's work uh, with uh, young home signers, we have a sense that they have a stable lexicon even fairly early in development. Now those data, those analyses are based on spontaneous productions of, right, these are play sessions the kids are just engaged in. So they're, they're and, and kids tend to talk about the stuff that's right there, right, they're kids. That's what little kids talk about, whether they're um, acquiring a language or not. When you're looking at a spontaneous, uh, well, so if you try to do the same kind of analysis with adult home signers, if you haven't controlled their production, it's very difficult to map one-to-one -one whether you see, whether a difference in form really does indicate a difference in meaning, if you don't know exactly, if you haven't fully constrained the meaning. So, um, I would say they have fewer stable, conventionalized items in their inventory than Nicaraguan signers. Uh, and I think they, they probably vary individually. But to get to the second part of your question, does that relate to, how, uh, to other aspects of their linguistic structure? That's something I haven't looked at systematically, but I, I have the data to, to do that. Um, it makes me think about a study that some of my colleagues did while we were in graduate school. Uh, Inge Marie Eichstein, a University of Chicago alum, and Carla Hudson Cam. They had hearing people, it's all about hearing people. Hearing people come in and they taught them some words in Persian. And then they tested them on their knowledge of those vocabulary items. And then they had them solve communication problems 
um, give each other directions in this little toy world kinds of things. And what they found is that the people who had better vocabulary scores actually had better syntax. It's like as if they, they call it the lexical competence hypothesis. So like already having pre-made words kind of makes you not have to work so hard to develop structure. So I, I think that's a very intuitive idea. Whether that's true in the case of the home signers, I haven't um, specifically asked that question. But you will be the first to know. <laughs> Not to see us. Yeah, please come up. Very interesting. Please, please come up. It's very. I think it's hard for people to hear you. I'm so loud. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was very interesting. I have two questions. So one is about the input. So I know from you know having known you for so many years. Uh, we say that in the home science there is no input, but in fact there, there is no linguistic input in the classical sense, but there is input in the gestural sense. Absolutely. And we know now from Susan's work again that post-speech gesture is an integral part of, of speech. So it's not necessarily the case that we know exactly where speech, where language stops and the post-speech gesture starts. I mean, it may actually be that there is even a continuum between the so it's not fully accurate to say that they don't have any input. So they have this gestural input. And I was wondering if you have studied or if you have any new thoughts about whether that kind of input drives their structures. I mean, we saw a little bit that it doesn't fully because we have this asymmetry between mothers and the output of uh, and what the signers produce. But um, then there is this other general question that I wanted to ask. So what does drive the, the home side in the end? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for your question. So you're right that um, co-speech gesture is very tightly integrated with the speech that it accompanies, but you can only interpret it in the context of that speech, right? It's an integrated system as long as you have both pieces. If you only have one piece, as you would if you were a home signer, that's, that, there's very little structure there, especially if you consider that um, McNeil has shown that people, when they're speaking, tend to only produce one gesture per clause. So you're not, even, you're not really getting gestures combining with each other that would offer the kind of structure that a home signer would be able to right. use. So I, I'm less worried about that than I am about the way that the home signers' communication partners actually gesture with them, which is often without using their voice. They do use the home sign system back to the home signer. Right, so this then becomes part of the input. So, it, it, so it, in principle, is out there in the world for the home signer to see. But the fact that the communication partners don't understand the home sign argues to me that they don't possess the structure that the home signer has. So it seems um, unlikely that they're producing it, but they're not able to comprehend it. Yeah. Or that it, that any, and of course now these guys are all 30 years old. They're all at least 30, right? So there's no way to go back in time except by studying younger home signers to compare Wh whose development is preceding whose, right? So presumably the communication partners have learned something from the, right? It's equally plausible if we see structure in the uh, gestures of the communication partners that they have learned that structure from the home signer, right? It's not obvious that the home signer learned it from them. We have to actually see it happening in real time. So Diane and I are actually engaged in uh, that, that longitudinal study of the child home signer, we have collected data both from him and from his primary communication partner, his younger brother, who is fortunately young enough to be really kind of uh, co-creating the system in a way that might approach what you're talking about. But we don't have those, I, I can't report any results from that. But that's certainly a question that we're interested in. Whether the home signs change over time, um, whether com the communication partners change over time, whether it looks like one is trying to match the other in terms of structure. I mean, I take those questions very seriously, but 
the available results don't support that kind of getting input argument. I see. Okay, well, it would require, of course, as you said, that we actually get to see the, um, you know, partners that are relatively close to be able to, to assess accurately. On the other hand, I was thinking that, you know, if we actually think of language acquisition, also, when the children are very young, they are exposed to a lot of input, but what they actually extract from that it, input is not necessarily all of the input. So they extract very little things because also their general cognitive abilities are not where they are yet. They don't really extract full sentences. You know, their phonemic um, comprehension is perhaps not you know what we think it is. So they. So if we mimic this and we transport it into a situation in which what the learner reads from the input is merely the gestural part and also the gestural part that gives the input for responding to their own gestural part, maybe what we see with the home side would be an extremity to what happens if the word language acquisition was just that part instead of the spoken. I was with you all, almost until the end. What was, the, if there were only that part, can you just the say what you mean? Part. So if you have a child, so like if you take a small child that, you know, with the cognitive abilities, the average cognitive abilities of a small child, they hear input, they hear words, but they don't understand what you're saying. They, they hear sound. Likewise, the deaf child, you know, hears exactly the same thing. They, I mean, they don't hear the sounds, but they see the gestures. So they extract from the input this particular aspect, which is the minor aspect. Is, so as the child, as the hearing child grows, they replace that, the co-speaker, the co-speech gestural part with actual uh, spoken language, but that never happens in the case of home. But they are, though, trained in extracting information and there are certain regularities and frequencies and everything else. They are trained in extracting information from that manual. Okay, here's, here's, here's one response that's, that's based on the evidence I, I presented today. If they're doing that kind of analysis of the input, mm -hmm. then shouldn't they use the same lexical items that their parents are using to them? But, but, we, don't, but we don't see that. Yeah, but you see that that system, the gestural system, is not as stable as the linguistic system. So the kinds of gestures that the parents use, you know, may differ also through time because once, before they establish a home sign with the child, they may gesture, you know, for meaning X in way Z, but as they communicate, that way Z changes into way R, it acquires a different form, and as the system builds itself, you know, the way the adult will even gesture is going to be more unstable than the linguistic input, which is kind of stable. You see what I mean? I mean no, I didn't see what you were saying. Then the linguistic input remains cat. You know, even uh, cat, as you know, I say cat, it's a yeah, cat or yeah. home or house. So the parents keep using the spoken they word. They keep using, you know, that. Right. But the, but the, the gesture for cat might change. Might change. That's and what we might. see. That is what we see. Their gesture right, for cat exactly. continues so to change. So that's the reason why we have this asymmetry. So they do acquire something from the input, but the input itself is not a, sta a set of stable lexical items. I don't disagree with that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But we, we don't see them converging. But that's what I'm suggesting, that maybe we don't see them converging because there is no stable <coughs> system that they have to converge with. That's the, I, that's the point I'm trying to make. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's the point I'm trying to make, right? There's nothing, I mean, when I say there's no linguistic input, I mean there's no stable. conventional, stable right. structure okay. that they are taking in, that they use the way that kids who are exposed but to linguistic I'm, input do. Mm -hmm. But as, I'm sorry to like, uh, you know, solve this, but as they develop, you know, the home sign, doesn't that become partly stable, like as a... So that, that's what we see. We see that they converge over time. The home signer and their mom and their sister and their brother, they get close, their responses to those items get closer together, but they're never at the yeah. point where they're all using this 25 years later, they live with each other. They're not using the same form. 
And I think that's because their communication is very contextually based. They are relying primarily on habits and routines and this is what we always do. I mean, it, they don't have a lot, I mean, so there's this paradox where they're doing, they're engaging gesturally so much more than the parents of the deaf children that Susan has studied. But they're still really limited in what they can really communicate. But the home signers are much less limited in what they can communicate because they communicate all kinds of stuff to me and to other people who've had the benefit of growing up with a sign language. That seems to give us an advantage in understanding what they're saying as it does for the ASL signers who have never met them. Right? There's something there to be understood. It's just not being under, it's not being taken up. So that's what, again, the, the, what leads me to argue that there's not so much going on out there because otherwise you would see more in the home sign. You would see more stability and more consistency. I'm really fascinated with this, but I really want to now move over to narrative. <laughs> okay. So from the two videos, I can show you more. <laughs> I would love to see more. Uh, but the two videos, the young man that was talking about the plane and the crash, and the other boy was talking about the plane and how the plane moved around. So I was noticing in the story what would happen is their eye gaze. That was very interesting to me. So it actually talked a little bit more about the action. It acted like a narrative shift, the eye gaze. So that was something that I noted, and I've noticed that for a long time now, whether it's first person or third person. So what was fascinating was the boy, when he talked about it, he looked at the plane, he looked at how the plane moved. And I saw that there. And then the concept of the plane and the pilot and the gun at the head, and he went from first person to third person. Well, that's a complex concept. Where does that come from? And how does it become the eye gaze, the literate relationship? Where does that all stem from? So that's one of my fascinations. Peter, thank you so much for your comments. Um, so we did in fact code things like whether the participants used changes in eye gaze to mark changes in, uh, um, sorry, I'm running out of steam here. Um, whether, it, whether it was a change from first person to third person or a change in character, for example, so we, we can um, look at those data more closely. I didn't report them in so much detail here. Um, in terms of the other, I agree with you, home signs are doing a lot of complex things that I haven't even begun to describe. There's these very, very, very rich data and I, I haven't been able to look at every aspect of all of their productions. Um, where does that, in terms of, you know, where does that come from? That's the $64,000 question, which I think with inflation is worth, you know, like $3 million now. <laughs> um, and I would say that clearly, I mean, here's the interesting thing about the home sign results. They clearly point to a biological basis for linguistic structure, but they also clearly point to the fact that not everything is going to emerge, right, in the absence of a linguistic community. Even if you have someone who's really trying to communicate with you and trying to talk to you every day. So some things depend on certain kinds of interactions, some things depend on having a linguistic community, uh, some things depend on that, uh, the expression of that structure passing through multiple uh, iterations of human, child human brains. So all of the work that Annie Stenghaus and all of our collaborators are doing is trying to identify what conditions are necessary for different kinds of structure to emerge. And that's kind of one of the goals I had hoped to achieve by, by raising these results with all of you is that 
the, you know, the, the biggest proponents of a biological basis for linguistic structure aren't taking on those, those really difficult questions. They're very sticky, right? How do we measure interaction? I mean, we just, uh, we're now paying attention to those kinds of things in typical language acquisition, but clearly they matter a lot uh, in these kinds of cases as well, even more. And we can see them so much more clearly because there's, there's that pesky input getting in the way. Um, I hate to put it in that glib way because I've already talked about the uh, limitations of language deprivation, but from a scientific perspective, this is a really amazing opportunity to ask those questions, and, but it's, it's not easy. And, and clearly these worlds are colliding. The importance of biology, the importance of this interaction, and those people don't talk to each other enough, in my view, and they don't, they're, they're kind of divided. And I'm, I'm hoping that we can break down some of those barriers and, and, and really get to the hard questions. Please come up. Cases where um, a home signer did decide to join the NSL community at the age of a teenager or an adult, and how did that, having grown up on home sign rather than a full fledged language, affect their NSL acquisition? Thanks for raising that point. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is the all of the Nicaraguan signers and the studies that I talked about today are early learners. Uh, it turns out that in Nicaragua, there are almost no deaf people born to deaf families the way that we have here in the United States. So pretty much the earliest age that most people are exposed is when they get to school. That age is getting lower and lower over time. So um, the, the younger people in the studies that I showed you entered the school and were exposed to Nicaraguan Sign Language by four or five years of age. But all of the people I showed you were exposed by five or six. So what we're not seeing, the differences in the cohorts that we see are not about um, late acquisition. So having said that, so that, because that's what we want to know. We want to know about whether the version of the language you learn affects your, um, the complexity of your linguistic structure, not whether the age of your acquisition affects that. We have an enormous body of evidence that shows that the later you acquire a language, the less proficient you will be at it. So we have not focused uh, in our work on that, although I know that Annie and her collaborators, uh, especially Amber Martin, have looked at the effects on spatial cognitive abilities based on the age that, that people were exposed to Nicaraguan Sign Language. But um, since the earliest work that Annie and I did, looking at uh, production of spatial modulation in a grammatical way, um, we, we did replicate that, um, you know, many, many prior findings showing that the later people are exposed, the, the less well they control the grammatical aspects of their language. And we, we did find that. Um, but that's not news. The news is this is a new language and it's, the language itself is changing over time. So we have focused on those differences. Yeah. 